there is a temptation that's especially prevalent in our industry, but in others as well, that when new technologies become available to the world, we want to kind of slap those on what we're doing. This is We slapped Wi-Fi on a bunch of things, but the world does not need a Wi-Fi enabled rolling pin necessarily, right? Now we are, we are in this sort of rhyming history uh, where AI is a thing that becomes very cheap and easy to slap on, but I'm not convinced that the world needs an AI enabled rolling pin either. <laughs> This is Mike Wolf, and welcome to the Spoon Podcast. Today's episode is the audio from the session, the very first session at the Smart Kitchen Summit 2024, Lessons from the First Wave. I had on this panel Chris Young from Combustion, Scott Heimendinger from Sans Ser fame and Monarch Cuisine, and his new company, Cuisonic, as well as Kai Schaffner, the former president of North America for Thermomix. I really wanted these guys on the session because they were there in the trenches during that first wave that we watched over the past decade or so around building future forward tech forward products for the kitchen. And they learned a lot of lessons and they're back at it again. And so it was a really great table setter for the day and for the, the two days at SKS. And I just thought, thought there was a lot of valuable takeaways here. So I just wanted to, Bring this. I've had a lot of people ask about this session, and so we thought we'd put it out on the podcast. So check it out. I'm now preparing for our next conference, the Food AI Summit, which will be on September 25th in California at Cal Berkeley. We're hosting it at the University of California, Berkeley. We've got some great speakers lined up. And if you're interested in learning more about how AI is transforming food, you, you won't want to miss it. So just go to foodsummit.ai, use the discount code podcast for 15% off tickets. And as always, we appreciate you listening. We appreciate uh, everything. And if you were at SKS, thank you for showing up there as well. We very much appreciate it. So, all right, let's get to my conversation from SKS with Chris Young, Scott Hammondinger, and Kai Schopner. Welcome, guys. I'm going to do quick intros because I want to jump right into the conversation. You know, we have with us uh, on the far left, Chris Young, who built a company called Chef Steps. You worked at a famous restaurant somewhere, and then you also, uh, you worked for Modest Cuisine. You actually co-wrote the book. Yeah, I co-wrote the we book, have, and I was the head chef, head development chef at the Fat Duck. All right, and we have with us Scott Heimendinger. You also you worked at Monarch's Cuisine. Uh, you kind of started to help invent this consumer sous vide trend back in 20, 2009, 2010. Did the first seventy five dollars sous vide circulator? Wrote an article about it that it was featured in a lot of patents. Uh, and then uh, you started a startup called Sancerre, and then. Uh, you came back and you're doing something again, and you're crazy enough to come back to the consumer kitchen. So there must be something there for you, though. So. Right. Yep. <laughs> and Kai Schaffner, I would argue that Kai led uh, and helped build, I think, what was probably the most successful digital recipe platform with a connected device for Thermomix. You were kind of the guy who helped building that Cook I Do platform for Thermomix, and you were there at the very beginning. Yeah, that's true. Awesome. So as you can see, we have the right people up here to talk about some of the lessons we learned from that first wave and you know where we go next so I want to start with you Scott you know you you were there early on and you probably learned some things you know uh, you build it you had a company you did the you did the whole thing you did the Kickstarter raise funds and then you did the startup and then ultimately you, you had to close that down and then as we were doing this prep call we were talking about some of the lessons we learned so what were some of the things as you look back that you reflect on that you you kind of think were some key lessons from that first wave? So I'll start with the thing that I think we did right. So uh, this this company was Sanzer, and as Mike mentioned, it was kind of born out of this article I put up on my blog for a $75 DIY sous vide machine. I had learned about sous vide, largely from the work of the folks at Modernist Cuisine, but it hadn't yet permeated into the lives of home cooks. And uh, and certainly the devices themselves were unaffordable and, and um, there wasn't yet a lot of information on how to use those. But once I bit that off and built one for myself and started cooking this way at home, I recognized 
how awesome it made me feel about my own capabilities. I think that sous vide was successful, not because of the technology or the way the physics of heat transfer work or whatever, but because a sous vide machine is a device that turns anxiety into confidence. So I think the thing that we did right was identifying a pain that lots of home cooks had and trying to design a product. We started with the price tag and then said, it has one job, let's make it as simple as possible. Even though we're talking about the first wave, our device did not have a, a Wi-Fi chip in it. Um, maybe, maybe that's something we did wrong. Um, uh, and, uh, and we made a whole bunch of happy home cooks by address it, by, by basically trying to evangelize, hey, we want you to feel as good as we do when you're using this way of cooking at home. And then what we did poorly was everything else. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay. Well, um, and we'll expound on those, I think, as we go along here. So, Chris, you know, you had Chef Steps, which I think at first you guys did content, I think, cooking content in a new and interesting way. And then you then married content with hardware in a new and interesting way. You had this sous vide circulator um, that also was interesting that you had to use that for. I think that was a first. Also, you did this crazy thing where you actually did Facebook uh, commands. You could actually control your sous vide with Facebook, which is kind of crazy. Yep. Or, um, yeah, we, we were doing chat GPT about five years too early. Yeah, too early. Exactly. <laughs> so don't spend the next 20 minutes because you could do that. But what are some of the key assumptions we made back then that we got wrong? Um, you know, so yeah, you're correct that Chef Steps was really an outgrowth of, of modernist cuisine. I'd been the, the principal co-author with Nathan, uh, Grant Crilly, one of my co-founders, had been one of our, our development chefs there. Ryan Matthew Smith had been the principal photographer for modernist cuisine. And as hard as it is to remember today, in 2011, uh, modernist cuisine was done, we'd wrapped up the book tour, and... YouTube was this very nascent thing, and we sort of recognized that three guys in a digital camera could start creating, you know, interesting videos, and you didn't need to create a book anymore, which is laborious, time-consuming, and really expensive. You could build an audience, you had distribution to the whole world, and we started putting videos online, and we very, very quickly built a, a, a passionate audience uh, of people who liked our content, and that is what started Chef Steps. That is what I think we got right. Um, what we got wrong over time was understanding how content would evolve online. You know, the in a certain sense, our thinking was probably too wedded to the era of blogging and the idea of pulling people back to your website, pulling them into a walled garden of a sort, and, and then attempting to monetize the content there. And I would say that that was ultimately self-defeating, that the content was really valuable for consumers discovering you, for you educating them about the types of things you could help them do in the kitchen. And then to the extent you tried to get them off the platform, um, the platform has made that harder and harder to do over time. The, to the extent you tried to get consumers to pay you directly versus monetizing the content indirectly, either through hardware sales, which we did later with Juul, or through you know, the way the, con the, the platforms have evolved monetization, which is ad revenue share, sponsorships, and increasingly e-commerce directly through the platforms, that was a mistake because ultimately the revenue was fairly de minimis from monetizing content directly, but you also sort of shot yourself in the foot and took away a very efficient way of consumers discovering you, discovering your, your, your product. So I think, you know, Chef Steps got into hardware because that customers were coming to us for sous vide content. Customers were coming to us to understand how to do some of these cooking techniques. We created hardware to solve that. We married it with content to help solve that. But what I think we got wrong was the sort of engine of growth, which was content had an important role to play there. Community had an important role to play there. And we sort of prematurely monetized that, um, rather than saying that was a way of bringing consumers in. Selling them hardware um, was going to be the way you were going to monetize those customers. So Kai, like I said early on, I think you could arguably, the argument could be made that you built one of the most successful, I think, products in that first wave with Thermomix and that digital recipe platform. And so with that in mind, you know, what were some of the, the, the lessons you learned about consumer behavior and their use of tech-driven tools in the kitchen? What, what did you learn in terms of using recipes and technology driving that? I mean, cooking is not easy. And I would say 10 years later, when I cook, I make a lot of mistakes. I don't know how you're doing it, but we do a lot of mistakes cooking. And 
what we try to have is the best result ever, right? I mean, we measure like, you know, Chris would cook, others would cook, that's how we want to cook. So doing this, and when you look through the entire customer journey, or let's call it cooking journey, you can do constantly stuff wrong. And then you have a lot of technology, and the question is, is it an obstacle? Is it making it even more difficult <laughs> to get your result or less? And then you have, I think we talk a lot about tech. But food is emotional. Food, and especially when you cook yourself, you want to have recognition. So there's a risk in cooking. Just for yourself, it's very frustrating when you screw up your high-level steak or whatever you're cooking. So there's a lot of risk in there, and you would like to have help right away in that step. And I think this is the part where we got a couple of things right, as you said too. You know, you said success made sous vide a great tool. And we have a lot of great tools, but how the hell I'm using it in that moment, in that situation? And then you have the components. You have hardware, you have a digital platform, you have technology, and you have an app. Does that make you successful? Maybe. Do I have just the spices at home? Can I deliver those things? Am I willing to put all the effort in in shopping? So there's a lot of things, and it's so easy just to take the up on DoorDash, right? So we're all kind of tired in the evening. We forgot certain things, and, and what I'm doing then? And I think the industry should help the people to have more things cooked at home to higher quality and also healthiness, and we will talk about this. Because there's a lot of motivation there, what people like to cook. Yeah. And then we look at our skills, we look at our appliances, yeah. and then we're kind of sweating how the hell we get there. And this is, I think, the willingness to pay. When there are good solutions out there who help you getting rid of the chorus and help you getting faster there where you want, you're willing to pay. And this, I think, is where you can make money. But it's not only the hardware. Yeah. So there are secondary revenue streams you can make profit from, but you need to get it right. And there is no, there is no shortcut. That's the problem with it. So looking back, you know, 2014 to 2020, it was a different time. <laughs> we, you know, capital was cheaper. Uh, IoT and smart was fairly new. Uh, we had new things like Alexa voice interfaces coming online. Um, we we're looking at software as a service business models and assumed we could apply that to a lot of different things. Um, but today, like, things are much different. There's a much different backdrop, both from an industry perspective and a societal perspective. So, Chris, you know, when you think about building a company today in this space, what do you have to consider? Uh, well, I'm, I mean, I'm actively doing it with combustion. So, you know, there are certain things that are vastly, vastly easier to build today than 2015 when Chef Steps was working. Uh, you know, there was, just on a software front, the amount of work... It, it, we had to do to build an IoT platform to get connectivity working. And as you mentioned, we built a sous vide device that could only be controlled in a connected way. So connectivity was sort of uh, a, a must get right for us. That was extremely difficult in 2016. It's not trivial today. There's still good and bad ways to do it and there's still important technical decisions to get right. But it is vastly easier. It's becoming more of a commodity. At the same time, consumers have an expectation that it, it, it will work in a very reliable fashion. Um, and so I think when you look at things like connectivity today, you really have to say, is this where you're creating consumer value? Is this worth the expense? You know, people are like, we want Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi shouldn't, you know, the problem is what we've, what we've learned is consumers aren't going to pay for Wi-Fi. You might be able to differentiate your physical hardware, but the idea that you're going to be able to charge them for digital services, which was an assumption we made in 2015, <laughs> that's deeply, deeply flawed. Consumers won't pay for it in my experience, and I don't really know anyone who's been successful in the consumer space doing it. And yet, I can put a number on, you know, it cost millions of dollars to run the DevOps team to support uh, Wi-Fi, to deal with weird routers that the Canadian government was giving out. All of the, like, I've seen all of that pain. It's very real. So we didn't launch combustion with Wi-Fi, for example, on, on day one. Will we get there? Very likely. But I could put a number on it, and, and, and it's this funny thing of consumers aren't willing to pay for it. They'd like it, but they're not willing to pay for it, and it's a very, very real expense on your P&L. And you have to go, is this the really big solve for, for consumers? And in 2015, we sort of assumed 
digital business models, that we would be able to sell the hardware at very low margins and make it back up on the lifetime value through digital services. That didn't materialize. That, you know, that was probably the most deeply flawed assumption in the early first round of IoT that I made, that several other companies that I know of made, and, and I think it's come back to say you really need to understand how important is connectivity to your product. Is it enough to differentiate the hardware? You can command a premium and get the margin on the hardware because, and knowing that will you be growing fast enough and will you have a large enough base of customers that's going to support the fact that you have to maintain that product for a life cycle. You know, uh, the products I sell right now, we're sitting there saying we're going to be on the hook for supporting these servers, keeping them running 24-7 for years to come. You know, what does that mean about the, uh, the company um, and how is it going to grow to support that? So I think that's sort of a, a more nuanced model of you could sort of wave your hands in 2015 and say consumers will magically pay for this. And now it's like, well, that's really expensive and software engineers aren't, aren't cheap. It's gotten easier to do the technology, but it's, it's, it's still something I think that a lot of people are making mistakes around yeah. today if you haven't got the scar tissue from doing it the first time. <laughs> So, Scott, we were doing our prep calls. I do prep calls for all of my sessions, and, and you had this uh, quote that I, I've been thinking about ever since. Uh, you, you said basically, to, in a sense, you hope this time around people center their innovation and their tools around what people really are doing in the kitchen rather than, hey, I know how to build a product. This will change the way people cook. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, there's a temptation that's especially prevalent in our industry, but in others as well, that when new technologies become available to the world, we want to kind of slap those on what we're doing. This is, we slapped Wi-Fi on a bunch of things, but the world does not need a Wi-Fi enabled rolling pin necessarily, right? Now we are, we are in this sort of rhyming history uh, where AI is a thing that becomes very cheap and easy to slap on. But I'm not convinced that the world needs an AI-enabled rolling pin either. Sure. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I, hope, I hope I haven't uh, ruined anybody's day in the startup showcase. Um, uh, instead, it, actually, it, one of my favorite things to do is to look back at the... Uh, videos that were produced for like world's fairs and that kind of thing from the 50s and 60s and whatever and you see this sort of graceful ballerina doing this effortless thing in the kitchen about making dinner so easy and th they're showing the same scenarios that we're all discussing today it really is the same thing it's you know what am i going to cook do i have the right ingredients do i know how to do it do it you know does does stuff help guide me through the process so i don't undercook or burn or whatever? Does it, does it make it easy and effortless? Do I get an Air Jordan scenario out of this, right? Can I, can I put these shoes on my feet and now dunk from the free throw line, whereas I couldn't have before, right? But, um, but those scenarios are more or less the same that they've always been. Uh, and so I really hope that in this next wave, Although there are pockets of value from applying AI to things, there are certainly things that it can help your devices do better than you could before. I hope that we don't fall into the temptation of just saying, oh, well, you know, now it's a rolling pin with ChatGPT, so therefore it's better I have a different business model. Instead, I really hope we, s we look at that rolling pin and say, what sucks about a rolling pin? Well, like my food gets stuck to it, or it requires a lot of arm strength to use, or I end up making wobbly dough, or whatever. Like, Look at the actual problems that people face in the kitchen and try to address those problems with better product design or whatever, and, and avoid the path of temptation, which is to slap on the thing that everybody's buzzing about right now and think that that will provide real value for people at home. That's great. Kai, what do you think of that? Do you, I, I think that's really valuable insight. Look at the problem that you have with the tools and how do you make them better? I mean, just place at normal homes a camera in the kitchen and just see when and why they get frustrated. So we are product-centric, we are channel-centric, but we are definitely not user-centric. And, and, and that's the key. I mean, why do people fail? Why they are frustrated? You know, when is the moment where I do not know how I should 
deal with this appliance or where to cook it, and I'm giving up. So there's a lot of frustration still in there when you look at it. And I think AI can help not so much in the product. I, it's very close, very close to the user and saying, shit, I'm stuck. Help me, Siri, whatever, you know. And I think this is where we can get, get, get together because the share of what is cooked at home to a higher quality and healthier is where the smart part should get measured at. So we are not smart, in my mind, if we can't enable to cook more and better. And this is really what happens in the kitchen is not what, what my dream is when I bought it, right? So I, I have, I mean, and, and when you look what you're really cooking, I mean, we may cook 50, 50 dishes. That's what our capability is, maybe rather 25. Yeah. And that's what I need to cook at certain times because my kids are hungry, they're coming home. So this is the starting point. It's not the dream of the 412,000 other recipes I could cook. Yeah. It is just what do I cook and which appliances can do the best in my kitchen. And the customer need a little bit of help there because the technology is there, but we need to enable them now, I think. You know, Chris, when I look at your new product, I, I, I have your combustion thermometer. I really like it. And I, I just noticed some differences from your previous product. It's not that the, the, the chef chefs was There's a display. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank God. Um, so uh, <laughs> it's also super low. We learned. <laughs> super low friction in the fact that, like, I don't need to register anything. I don't need to send my email to anyone. There's, you know, I don't need to download an app from the app store. It's just frictionless in a way. Like, was that one of the key takeaways for you? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the fascinating thing about Jewel is we had a perfect record of, because it was fully connected, we had a perfect record of everything everyone ever did. And we, you know, we could pull up a database and see the steps of what did they push in the app? What did they do? When did they cook? And, you know, we had data scientists on the team and, and all of those kind of things. And you said, well, what was the value of all of that? Because that's a really expensive set of infrastructure to run and, and do something with. You're like, not much. Um, and and it, from, a, from a business standpoint, like, did I make any meaningful business decisions on the basis of that data? No, I don't think I did. And, and yet, you, you can and did irritate consumers. I think we probably cut our market share in half versus Innova by the decision not to have a display uh, on the device. Um, like, there was always going to be one that would eventually have it. We just never got around to doing it. Um, with combustion, there was a few things. One, connectivity has to work 100% of the time. So, you know, I made some unconventional decisions with how we do Bluetooth to get rid of the pairing process where our thermometer just always advertises its data and anything that uses the, we have an open source protocol, so any app that knows how to listen to that could see the temperature. And you're like, well, isn't that kind of insecure? Not really. I guess maybe the neighbor could know what the temperature is like your, for your the temperature of turkey. But, but from the consumer business, the average connection time is 600 milliseconds. It feels instant like you're just hitting an on button. Making you go through a registration process, and I just did this with some apps I won't mention that are made by people in this room, where you know I'm qualified to create these apps, um, but I wasn't qualified to get through registration because dumb things like I have a combustion.inc email address that is not recognized by their system, so I could not finish registering to their system and had to create a burner email address. These are really annoying consumer friction points. If I did not have a really good reason to want to use that app, I would just never have connected. And, and, you know, it wanted my phone number and it wanted my email address and it wanted my physical address and just to be able to see, is there any value in this app? And it's like, well, that's a bunch of bullshit. Um, and I think it's, you know, I can see, you know, I can imagine being in the meeting where that decision got made of like, well, it's better to grab all this data, but you're losing sight of the customer-centric approach to this. And so, yes, with Combustion, we said, there may be things in the time where we do have to ask accounts to create it because there's no way around it. Um, Wi-Fi would force that issue. But consumers just want to use the product. They paid for it. They want to have an experience. And the most valuable thing is for consumers to use your product the first few times and get a great outcome with it because they will tell their friends. It makes your marketing more efficient. It makes it easier to, to, to sell the product. And that's what you're really in the business of. And this problem is very true. I point the finger for this problem at the funding sources for some of these companies. This is a direct result of these companies being in, enclosed, let's say, kindly, in a funding model that expects 
software as a service like returns. It expects venture capital style returns where you have to have all of the customers demographic information because you're going to try to monetize all this stuff because those styles of funding are not set up to be sustainable where uh, where the model is I make a widget you buy it for more than it costs me to make and then maybe you buy another one again in a few years and and you're happy right that's it that's that is the model of regular consumer hardware that if when i buy a rolling pin i'm we're, we're going to start the rolling pin industry today um that's how it works i go to the store i buy a rolling pin it's great i'm happy but that does not work for venture capital uh and that i think is the origin of a lot of this funkiness a lot of the software business like stuff that permeates because you're forced to um so if you want to uh if you want to make something that just makes people happy in the kitchen today in this new wave i think you really have to build your business model from the ground up in a way that can support just selling your thing for the money consumers pay for and maybe that's all you see from them and that is a very different style business you have to hire differently you have to scale differently you have to have different expectations for exits and operating costs and all that stuff from the very beginning uh, otherwise it's infeasible chris i feel like you're getting teed up to say something there or am i wrong <laughs> I think just something I'll point out since we are at the Smart Kitchen Summit and, you know, I've been creating apps for, for appliances now for uh, 12, 13 years. Um, if you go spend time at tech companies that are really hardcore tech companies, uh, you know, Valve Software I had a close connection to, you know, one of the things you quickly learn is they're really good about looking at how to reduce friction to consumers using the, the, their product, like obsessively. The, the, the benefit that people in this room would have by pulling out their app going through a new user flow and counting how many times, do, how many buttons from, from hitting, from pulling out the app, from unlocking it, from hitting it, how many times do you have to touch it just to do the job you want to do? It's shocking to me, absolutely shocking to me how bad that is for everyone. And everyone has a perfectly rational explanation for why it needs to be that way, but it doesn't. I want to uh, make sure that we have a hopeful message up here because you guys aren't gluttons for punishment. You came back and you're doing it again. So you have a passion for this space. Why is that? Why, what are you, you're back here creating tools for the consumer in the kitchen again. Why is that? I want to revisit that feeling of making people feel like superheroes in their own home kitchens. I want to, I, I have a thing. It's not announced yet, which is why I'm being coy. You're kind of hinting at it a lot on LinkedIn. Yeah, so. a, a little bit. Um, but if it works, I hope to create that moment again where you feel more capable than you ever thought you could be in your own home kitchen. And unfortunately, the way to get there is just really hard. Building hardware in a smart kitchen space is a very challenging uh, way to build a business. This time around, one of my learnings was the way that I shaped and funded my company. Um, it's not uh, based on venture capital, and so I am able to sell the widget for more than it costs me to make it and achieve my business goals in that way and not have to have sign up flows where I'm relying on demographic information and, and do all this stuff. It's part of the reason I'm, I'm sort of obnoxiously passionate uh, about that way of doing things. Um, but I think that in order to make it just work and make it uh, simple and let you open the box and start using the thing and hopefully put a smile on your face, I, that had to start with the way that I shaped my company. Do you need a robotic arm in your, in your room like you do to, to build a startup? You know, need is a funny <laughs> word. When I, when I do a Zoom call with Scott, I recommend doing it because he'll have a big robotic arm in the background that he can control and wave at you. So that's fun. I want to ask you each of the same question, Chris and Kai. Um, why are you coming back? Chris, start. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist who became a chef, and I've been in the hospitality industry for over 22 years now, I think. And, you know, at the highest end of restaurants to writing cookbooks, my whole career <clears throat> has been about hospitality. It's been helping people... Uh, cook and enjoy great meals. At the restaurant, that actually meant cooking for a few thousand people a year. Writing modernist cuisine was a way of giving back to things we'd figured out at a small number of restaurants in the early 2000s. It was a way of contributing back to the industry and helping people innovate and create great meals and experiences. Chef Steps and Jewel and the content was about people helping people cook, helping them be successful. 
What's interesting about smart technology done well, and I do think people who own Juul loved it for the most part, um, or Combustion Day, is we're trying to help people be successful in the kitchen, and it's a way of doing hospitality at scale. You know, by the time I sold Chef Steps, we'd had, uh, I think it was 10, 15 million meals cooked with Juul. My entire time as a chef, I probably cooked for less than 6,000 people. So the ability to think about how do you help people have a great meal, enjoy a great meal, through technology is something that's uh, compelling to me. Kai? Personally, I think that mankind needs to get back getting control under for, for their nutrition. I think when you look at nutrition, to which degree we all earn diseases because we're not eating right. So I think this industry has everything they need to cook and let people cook healthy at home. Better, cheaper, faster, full control, what you are eating. And I think this is really um, a higher cause for me to, to enable really the industry and help wherever I can that we can cook more healthy at home. And we can't afford, you know, having uh, the, our healthcare system taking care of our bad nutrition. I, 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 I think that we all need to think about that, how we are cooking in the future. And I think this is one part that motivates people to go back in the kitchen. It's, it's not the app, I agree. You know, it's, it's the result I want to have. But I, I need help out there that, that people are doing it. And you used the word I like a lot. You said effortless. I mean, it's not effortless. It's not. It's a lot of work, and that's why people do DoorDash, I think. So that's my, my cause to come that's back great. or to stay. That's, thank you, guys. Um, t about 30 seconds each, just kind of quick rounds, kind of going from Chris. What are you most excited about kind of uh, over the next 10 years as you're looking at the kitchen? Um, you know, as much as, as, as Scott was skeptical of AI, and I share that skepticism because it will be done badly by a lot of people, it will be slapped on, uh, the, the reality is there are problems that I worked, I worked on going back 10, 15 years that were intractable and unsolvable at the time you made fun of our, our, our Facebook chat bot, but the idea of a command line interface where humans can say, this is what I want to do, generate a recipe on the fly that works with, like these things are actually doable now. And so there are cases where I think technology applied judiciously and intelligently around what is the person actually trying to do and can you solve that problem. I think these get solved in the next 10 years. My specific example is a thermometer that can basically implement a machine learning model of physics to answer a very simple question of when will my food be done? Is it safe to eat? How much will it carry over cooking? Those are exciting because they weren't solvable and they're real human needs. I, I'm excited about broad advancements in science that will find their way into the kitchen. AI is part of that story, but I'm also excited about the way that bioengineering will produce new and novel ingredients or more nutritious food, longer shelf life, that kind of stuff. These are long-term things, uh, but I, I kind of can't wait for that version of the kitchen of the future. Awesome. The Star Trek uh, food replicator? Yeah, yeah. or, okay. or six-hour lettuce. That's, uh, that's my big pitch, yeah. Kai? I would hope that AI gets more to the user and not so much into the appliances. So AI can listen. And I hope they can enable. But we need to ask the consumer what they want and not just tell them to use what's there. Well, I wanted you guys on stage to kick this off because you guys have been there and I, I respect all your opinions. Um, give these guys a big round of applause. I think it's been a great session. All right. Thank you, guys. All right, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. That was a great session, and we will be sharing more of the sessions, the audio from the sessions at SKS. We had a lot of great insights flying around the room during those two days at SKS. We want to share more of those with our podcast audience. Like I said at the top of the show, if you are interested in how AI is changing food, and it definitely is, you'll want to go to the Food AI Summit. Just go to foodsummit.ai, check it out. Use the discount code podcast for 15% off tickets. All right, we will be getting back at our regular schedule with a SKS in the rearview mirror. We will be having a news wrap-up show with Carlos and I this week, so keep an eye out for that as well. So this podcast was brought to you by myself, Michael Wolf, and The Spoon, and is part of The Spoon Podcast Network. We will be having more news on podcasts very, very soon. So if you're interested in podcasts and food tech and all that great stuff, uh, keep your eyes peeled 
keep, keep your ears peeled? What do you, I don't know what you keep peeled. Keep your eyes and ears open, and uh, we'll hopefully have more news for you very soon on that regard. So that's it. We'll talk to you soon.